Hey, this is Brett Murphy, co-creator of Paranormal Hitman, and you're listening to the Nerd by Word podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into another special episode of the Nerd by Word podcast. We are back in the interview circuit. We've got Brett Murphy. He's the writer and co-creator of Paranormal Hitmen, a fascinating new title coming February 2021 from Behemoth Comics. But first, we have nerd news. And Dave, you've got some unfortunate news for us. What's going on? You know, not to give you flashbacks to the 80s or something, but I'm I'm thinking of that slogan, Lego of my ego. Uh, how about Lego of my DC Comics? Uh, because AT&T is at it again. Warner Media has once again downsized DC Comics in what can only be considered a metaphorical bloodbath. Lots of people in leadership positions have lost their jobs, many who have been at DC for over 20 years. People let, uh, let go include event coordinators, uh, the co-editor-in-chief... Uh, franchise management staff, marketing employees. You know, once again, I find myself seriously concerned about all the restructuring happening at my favorite comic book company. Uh, Marvel, I love you, but, you know, make mine DC. The continued downsizing, the loss of decades of experience in the business and at the company itself, uh, the cancellation of series, all this causes me deep concern. We've talked so many times about the notion that these corporate entities that are now in charge of DC and Marvel see the the comic book arm more uh, like a like a minor league sort of farming situation. It is kind of like farming these ideas rather than really nurturing that part of the business. And now that we're seeing all these these cuts and all this restructuring, it seems like they're looking to save money in the short term rather than investing in the company and making more money in the long term. It is not a growth mindset. And that really worries me long term for DC Comics. You know, the health of the comic book industry can often be measured by the success of the big two, DC and Marvel. And DC is in such of an odd position right now, with so much negative press drowning out any positive developments. As a fan, I just want good comics, but this corporate culture of pinching every penny, of taking no risks, of firing long-term employees to save a quick buck rather than using their experience to grow the industry, I fear that the quality at DC is going to end up suffering in the long run. Chris, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, this is this is insane. And 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 this is not the first big corporation to make extensive layoffs and cuts like this. Um, you know, ESPN over there, it's it's similarly a massacre. Um and it is you know, setting off bombs over there as well and and angering lots and lots of fans. Um and it, it it's almost like that that scene from The Fresh Prince where Will Will is standing there in an empty house just by himself. That's what it's like when you go to the Warner lot, I would imagine, nowadays. Like, everybody is gone. And and how many times do we have to have this as a news story? How many times do we have to lead the show with a negative story about DC or Warner Media or, you know, the the, the properties that that AT&T holds? And, 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 and to continue with your analogy... I, I don't think it's it's untrue or inaccurate to view comic books as a farm system. But to continue that further, the best organizations in sports have strong farm systems. You look at the Los Angeles Dodgers, who just won the World Series. I'm going to you know be a sports nerd here for a minute. The LA Dodgers, who just won the World Series, they made a few splashes in free agency, but the majority of their team were young stars that they – drafted that they you know cultivated through uh the farm system and then when they reached the major leagues it was all homegrown like you know talent that they didn't have to go and and they were playing the long game and it paid off and and i wish at&t um you know and, and disney to an extent as well would would you know pay attention to to things like that if they really believe that it's you know a minor league type of deal 
you know, that's where your stars are born. Not, not just, you know, the short term bang and, and, and the now dollar. Yeah, the whole thing is extremely troubling. And I really appreciate your sports analogy. I can go ahead and be a sports nerd for a moment as well. Um, when Germany won the World Cup a few years ago, that was ultimately a very young team. And the result, again, of an incredible investment long term by the Bundesliga into their youth leagues, into their minor leagues, into their farm leagues, to make sure that they had young uh, upcoming talent that was capable of coming together and winning a World Cup. So ultimately, this is exactly what we're talking about here. How about instead of cutting everybody out of the loop, instead of trying to save money short term, you invest in your minor leagues, and then later you get a much higher return. Uh, this is for a, for a corporate entity. It is so strange for me that they don't seem to have a growth mindset. It's about minimizing costs in the short term rather than growing the market and making more money in the long term. It seems like such a counterintuitive way of running a business. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not, you know, a CEO of a major corporation or something. I'm far from an expert. But I mean, it seems intuitive enough to me that if you create good product, then ultimately you will be able to grow the business. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll never forget that World Cup. Number one, for how insufferable you were as a German national team fan. Um, and number two, <laughs> and number two, th just the the beautiful irony of of embarrassing Brazil on their home turf like that, and and the entire entire stadium is just dead silent within the first few minutes of the match. It was great. It was an it was an, an incredible World Cup for Germany uh, in a, in so many different ways, and and just a sterling performance and a testament to the notion that if you invest, it, then in the long term you're going to reap benefits. Now, Chris, talking about reaping some benefits, let's talk about something a little more positive. What have you got for us? Well. Um... You know, digital comic readers like myself um, are, are super excited for things that are going to come. Now, I'm already a subscriber to Marvel Unlimited. I have been, you know, pretty much since its inception. Um, I recently, um, you know, started my, my subscription with Comixology Unlimited. And, and now um, the DC Universe is shifting um, towards uh, DC Universe Infinite uh, starting in January of next year. Um, it's basically going to be, you know, similar along the lines to what Marvel Unlimited is, um, and it is going to ship out all of the DC film and TV content to HBO Max. So um, they are focusing solely on digital comics. Um, it's interesting that um, uh, I'm reading a Games Radar article uh, that DC uh, Universe went from. A, a year out comics, comics that were a year later were put on the platform. They reduced that to six months to catch up with Marvel Unlimited. And then immediately Marvel Unlimited updated theirs to three months. So while they're in direct competition with one another and, and trying to keep up with the uh, proverbial Joneses, you know, people who enjoy both companies content and just want to read a whole bunch of comics and, you know, binge entire runs in, in a short time, uh, you know, Netflix style, we're just in heaven because, because we don't have to worry about it. So, so come January, 2021, I'm going to be reading a whole lot more comics, which it didn't seem like I could read more, but I'm super excited for this development. Dave, what are your thoughts? So I'm going to be straight up with you. Number one, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of digital comics. And it's uh, it's less so uh, a notion that they necessarily need to replace print comics. T to me, it's ultimately about accessibility. Anything that makes it easier to access comic books is a good thing in my book, especially when it comes to back issues. And it's all nice and dandy that uh, both DC and Marvel have, you know, decent turnover rates for their newer books. You know, three months uh, after a book comes out, it pops up on Marvel Unlimited. Six months after it comes out, it's on DC uh, Universe Infinite. That's great. But that would not be the primary purpose for me for a subscription service like that. So much of the output of both of these companies is difficult to find. Uh, trades are out of print. Individual issues are expensive collector's items. Um trying to figure out even how to uh, put together a storyline that went over multiple issues across multiple series. 
You know, I'm a huge fan, for example, of the triangle era of Superman. When Superman comics in the 90s uh, were published uh, through four different series, but you had to read them in order because they all formed a continuous story. That era of Superman was fantastic, but go ahead and try to go into a local LCS and put together a run of that triangle era across all these different series. It's almost impossible. Now, with digital, you have a real opportunity there. You are providing all these back issues. You can create basically like playlists of reading orders so people can follow a storyline or a crossover event easily. And really, that's what you need. These companies are so storied and have so much history and so many excellent comic books that are basically inaccessible to modern readers. And I I think it's fantastic that with services like this, which have very little overhead, I think, for, for companies like DC and Marvel, you're basically taking back issues and slapping the files on there for people to read. There's no printing cost or anything associated with that. And at the same time, you get to make money off of these properties and you're making the stories accessible again. And in the end, access is key. A subscription service that puts thousands of comic books at the fingertips of fans is simply good news for everybody, even the local LCS ultimately. Because if somebody reads old storylines, gets hooked on a particular character, and then goes to an LCS to seek out new product, well, that's ideal. That's a way to grow the industry. So increasing access to newer issues is something that I'm sure people will be interested in. But for me, it's really the back issues that that makes these services worth the money. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So, um, you know, right here, when I log into the Marvel Unlimited app, right next to the home button is a reading list button. And and you go to this reading list and, and they have everything. Um, you know, it's a sore subject right now because we just talked about one more day, but they have Marvel marriages, which is a featured storyline because Wiccan and Hulkling were just married. So, but I, I is want... Mary Jane and Spider Man still on? There's my question. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to click on that, and I don't want to be upset. <laughs> but for example, they also have you know characters, and you know one of the featured characters right now is Mantis, and and they also do a great job of cross promotion. You know when a movie comes out. So like you know a couple of years ago when Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two came out, and you saw this alien with antennas sticking out of her head, and you were like, "Who is that?" And then you go to Marvel unlimited and here's mantis here's her origin story and her first appearance here's all these other avengers tie-ins or 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 where she was a part of the avengers and when she was important and 10 to 15 issues if you want to know more about mantis and it's just a really smartly done thing you know and and for my spider-man read through that would never have been possible where am i going to come across uh, you know, Amazing Spider Man number, number one, two, three, four, five. You know, all of that. Um, you know, and then you talk about the events like you talked about the Triangle Era of Superman. For me, that was Maximum Carnage. You know, there is no way all those different titles or the Clone Saga. God forbid, I would have never been able to bounce back and forth those. But those reading lists in Marvel Unlimited, um, and even the suggestions list that I found in Comicsology Unlimited, uh, have been indispensable for me. So I'm super excited for for what's going forward here, and you know, I'm ready to binge a whole lot more comics. So I'm gonna go ahead and go off on a tangent and just say that uh, I miss Ben Riley sometimes. I know it's weird to say that the Clone Saga is not exactly popular, but there was something about Ben Riley that I always thought worked right down to his Spider-Man suit, that redesigned Spider-Man that suit. suit was that cool. suit was amazing. It was it was so dope. That was the best thing out of the 90s Spider-Man. Yeah, I totally agree. I love the suit. I really liked his his character. I liked this this uh, clear contrast they drew between him and Peter Parker, where Ben was a little more, you know, techie and was trying to create new gadgets like impact webbing and stuff. He was just a cool character. And it brought him back a, f- a couple of years ago and tried to do a new Scarlet Spider but, series no, with a return oh, Ben Riley, no. And it was not good because Ben Riley wasn't Ben Riley. He didn't behave like himself. He was more an anti-hero or almost a villain. And, and that was just not Ben Riley. So, uh, yeah, you know, the Clone Saga was a mess. But that character, for some reason, I always really appreciate it. I, I love the duality of that. And 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 um, I, I one of the issues that I really you know stands out to me is when when aunt may was 
oh, it's, you know, excuse me if you've heard this before, when when Aunt May was bedridden in the hospital, um, and then you had both Peter... Oh, it must be a Tuesday. <laughs> so, uh, but you had both Peter and Ben, you know, like, breaking down crying. That was, you know, a super powerful thing. It was super cool to see the two of them interact, you know? Um, like I said last, like I like, like I said last episode, um, I, I don't hate the Clone Saga that much. It was just jumping back and forth between different titles that was annoying. But then when I found those reading lists, it was much easier. It's so fascinating to me, and I've I've proclaimed my uh, my love of '90s back issues before. But it's also fascinating to me how many people now kind of take a dump on on Maximum Carnage. That was one of the few storylines that I was able to get a hold of in comic books back in uh, in Germany when I was living over there. And that was just, that was peak Spider-Man for me. There was so much going on there. At one point, Captain America shows up and I was like, holy crap. And then- I remember that issue, yep. Yeah, and how he stands over him and is reaching down. It's like so inspirational. And then they brought in, they brought, uh, brought in Firestar. From you know, like the the uh, the Amazing Friends cartoon, and when yep. she showed up, I was like, "Oh wow! Now you're really digging into the stuff that I loved as a, as you know a young child. This is amazing." So uh, I, that storyline, as odd as it is, holds a very special place in my heart. Me too, because um, that's the era. Correct me if I'm wrong. We got the God Mark Bagley starting on Spider Man, so I don't care. Oh, very much so, man. He is just so good. Uh, his Spider Man. No matter if it's you know Ultimate or or six one six, his Spider Man is just gorgeous. I could wax poetic about that all day, and I all love to Ditko and Ramita. He draws my favorite Spider Man. I'm right there with you. I can I can spot a, a Bagley Spider Man T shirt about ten miles against the wind. It's always troubling when I'm nerding out. Oh, I really like your Spider Man shirt. That's a Bagley shirt, and the, and people are like, uh, who who what? I just I just bought a <laughs> Spider Man shirt. I was like, no no, that's that's a Bagley Spider Man shirt. This is quality <laughs> stuff right there. My one of my you know, and and we talk about being a collector versus a reader. Um, no no no. One quick point before we before I move on to that is. And you hit the nail on the head. When I when I read the last Ronin digitally, I immediately put my phone down, put my phone in my pocket, got in the car, and I went and picked up a physical copy. So like it happens. Like I just want to be able to read it. And accessibility when it comes to digital comics, that does it. But then like, you know, I, I'm kind of dipping my toe into becoming a collector. Um, you know, and I try to go like on on a an Instagram live claim sale and they've got issues three, five, seven nine in a series where are the other ones where is my hope of reading that entire you know crossover you know so so digital is a requirement you know and i and i love both i there's still nothing compared to the smell of an old comic um but but to to piggyback off of the the bagley conversation my most treasured possession of the few comics that i do have in my collection is the marvel 1000 variant cover that bagley did and it's just beautiful it's it's the ultimate spider-man you know kingpin's there it's the ultimate green goblin which is such an amazing design i I love it so much yeah i can't blame you man and you know it's i would say that you know the relationship between digital and how it inspires people to actually purchase is is very much akin to something like uh netflix uh how often do you watch something on netflix you know it's not going to be there forever you know it's uh, some something some kind of timed licensing deal or something you watch it you like it and you're like you know what I want to be able to watch this again anytime I want to. So I'm going to go ahead and buy the DVD set, you know, yeah. very similar concept with digital comics. Um, I know that digital makes a lot of uh, comic shop owners nervous. They, they find it uh, to be competition. Uh, ultimately, I, I think it's not competition. I think it's something that can inspire people to want to pick up physical comic books. And that's, you know, that's the the lead line when I walk into an LCS on Wednesday. It's like, yeah, I just read this this morning and I want a physical copy. I, I tell them that every time. So, all right. Uh, that wraps up our nerd news segment for this week. When we come back from this, our first break, we're going to sit down with Brett Murphy, author and co-creator of Paranormal Hitmen. Stick around. <laughs> All right, welcome back, nerds. We're here with Brett Murphy, author and co-creator of the comic Paranormal Hitmen. Um, Brett, thanks so much for joining the show today. Hey, thanks for having having me. I uh, I appreciate it. So every nerd loves a good origin story. That's where we started our podcast with our own origin stories. 
how did all this get started for you and what sparked your interest in comic books? So, uh, basically I've been a comic book fan since I was, um, you know, in grade school and second, third grade. Um, I've always had that passion, um, going to my local comic shop and, you know, picking up the new comic books that were released or, or the trades that were, that just came out. So, I mean, the passion for comic books has always been there, um, basically my whole life. Um, as for the writing side of things, uh, it kind of all started, um, back in college. I kind of had the, um, I guess the writing itch, um, after taking a couple of, uh, college courses and I actually went out and started writing for a, uh, a couple of, uh, music blogs and that kind of helped uh me kind of get back into writing and um kind of hone in on my writing skills and then a couple of years later um I had a couple of ideas for some different uh stories that I wanted to um turn into uh graphic novels and here we are today with uh Paranormal Hitman. Now that's fantastic. Now in in my research looking kind of into uh uh, some of the other things that you've talked about in interviews, I noticed that you mentioned that uh, Chris Claremont's writing was a pretty big influence on you. Were there any other uh, comic book writers that you feel uh, have been a strong influence on you? Um, I mean, Chris Claremont, like you said, is uh, you know top top of the list. He was you know kind of the biggest influence on me. Um, Larry Hama uh, with his GI Joe run um, was another person that I kind of like to read a lot of his his works and um you know some some of the artists too that got me into you know really into comic books uh you know enjoying them was uh you know the whole 90s era with uh with you know the image boys like Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee um you know that whole time period was my childhood so so that kind of got me really into comics and um kind of kept my uh, passion for it going now paranormal hitmen is is a pretty unique book where did this idea come from uh yeah so i always had an idea to kind of do a um like a gangster mob type of uh book and you know I've, i was always a fan of goodfellas sopranos you know most of uh martin scorsese's uh mob movies and um i was also a fan of you know men in black and ghostbusters so i kind of melted all those ideas together and kind of came up with the whole paranormal hitman uh universe and you know once i started writing the script it kind of all came together in my head and and um you know all these different ideas for different issues started to come out and you know meeting with Wilson you know with his artwork it just made it that much better and um and and that's kind of how we came up with uh the uh different issues and and kind of expanded on the idea of paranormal hitman that that's really funny because that's exactly the epiphany I had when reading it I was like this is ghostbusters meets goodfellas so it, it really is evident, you know, in the in the product when when I was reading the first issue. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 exactly what we were going for. Was you know, you know, mobsters meets uh, Ghostbusters. Now, in in reading the first issue, it really um it really stood out that this is a period piece and appears to be taking place sort of in the late nineteen seventies. That's really fascinating. Why did you decide to make it a period piece rather than something that's set in uh, in present day? Well, uh, it's, it's actually uh, interesting because uh, when I first came up with this script, it was actually a present day uh, piece. And when I brought the script to Wilson, he kind of came up with the idea of like, hey, why don't we kind of do this in like the 60s or 70s and make this, you know, um, you know, a past time period instead of making it present day. And I liked that idea. and um, you know, I thought on I thought on it a couple of days, and I started changing the script to have it be in the 70s. 
and that's how we kind of came up with the idea to throw in, you know, um, references to like the Vietnam War and how that whole um, story kind of came to be. And also another thing that we liked um, with the 70s is Agent McCoy is kind of a resemblance of Pam Greer. So we kind of made it like that everything kind of fits that, that time period. Now, you referenced, um, you know, growing up with comics, but what, why go with this story as a comic book rather than a novel or a screenplay? Uh, what makes this uh, a comic book and, and makes that medium so special to you? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the thing that makes it real special is, um, like I said, I, I like going to, you know, the comic shop on Wednesdays and, you know, seeing what's the what just came out and picking up uh, new comic books every Wednesday. And, I mean, it, it was my goal to have a um, comic published where it would be in uh, the previous magazine and would ship out by Diamond and I can go to the local comic book store and pick it up. And I think that's really why I decided to make this into a comic series instead of uh, making it into like a novel or a novella and, or a screenplay. I, I just, I felt like it had to be a comic book. And once I found uh, Wilson and saw his art, that kind of just, you know, sealed the deal. I mean, his art, I mean, this book would be nothing without his art. Now, you, you've referenced uh, Wilson Gandolfo several times here already. Tell us a little bit about how that whole partnership came to be and and, you know, obviously he inspired uh, the, the setting a great deal. Uh, what else did he sort of bring to the table? How did the project change once he got involved? Yep. So um, I, uh, uh, through a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Matt Kuhn, who's uh, uh, also another uh, talented writer, and he's actually um, um, been doing uh, some of the edits on uh, Paranormal Hitman. He had worked on a couple comics uh, before with Wilson. and. Um, I noticed Wilson's artwork in the books and I, th I thought it was great and what I had in mind for Paranormal Hitman. So I reached out to him and, um, you know, I sent him the script and he loved it except he wanted to make it, like I said before, it take place in the 70s or 60s. And that's, uh, that's the type of thing that I like when it comes to working with Wilson is it's really a good partnership. Like, it's 50-50. Um, you know, if something needs to be changed with the writing, he's not afraid to say, hey, why don't we try this instead of doing what you wrote down? Or same thing with the art. If I say, you know, hey, why don't we add this into the cover or add this into the panel? You know, it's a good partnership. Um, you know, we're not afraid to kind of bring some ideas to the table. and. Um, there's going to be uh, one interesting thing is there's going to be a um, in the later issues kind of a, um, a special group of ghosts that are really villainous and evil. That was Wilson's idea, and you know that's one thing that he brings to the table is ideas like that. And so far, it's it's just been a great uh, a great uh, partnership and and friendship as well. Now, Paranormal Hitmen is published by Behemoth Comics. Um, how did you get involved with them, and, and why were they the right fit for this book? Yeah, um, so when we were uh, pitching the comic book, we had a couple of different publishers that were interested in the book. And it's kind of funny. I was on um, Facebook one day, and I noticed a post from somebody for... I think it was the Osiris Path. Um, it was either that, or I think it was actually Blackout, um, which is a series that Behemoth put out. And I was like, oh man, this looks pretty cool. And I, I did some research on them, and I, um, I made sure that they were going to be distributed through Diamond. And we actually sent our pitch to them, and I talked to Nathan Yoakum, who's one of the uh, co-founders. And, you know, they, they took a look at the book and they said, hey, uh, you know, we like it, uh, you know, we'd like to publish it. And what sold me on them is 
all the projects and different licenses that they were working on at the time. And it kind of clicked in my head, like, hey, these guys are going all in and they're really going after it. So that kind of made my decision to um, have them publish Paranormal Hitmen. And, I mean, I'll say this to that behemoth. They are, I mean, some of the licenses that they are um, working with now and working on, it's just unbelievable. It's, uh, you know, it's it's going to be an awesome uh, next couple of years. And, I mean, every day it's like something new comes out that, that um they're working on and it's it's just amazing. I mean it's a it's a really good publisher. Now that's fascinating. I've always been very interested in in sort of the the indie scene in particular. Um it seems like the most successful comics still are predominantly superheroes. Uh, it seems really like an uphill climb sometimes with non-superhero comics to really make an impact. So uh, r- why write something so different? Uh, when something superhero might make an easier impact on the market. Yeah, um, I mean, with, with in my my opinion for superheroes, I, I feel like that should just be, you know, the big two. Marvel and DC should, you know, I mean, they kind of have the superhero market because, you know, in my mind, you know, they already have, you know, the staples there in place. And I feel like, for indies, it's better to kind of stay away from superheroes because you can come out with some crazy unique concepts where you don't have to worry about, you know, a shareholder's opinion like you do at a Marvel or DC. And I feel like that's kind of what makes indie comics, um, you know, pretty good. Uh, I, I mean, like really good reads, um, in my opinion, because you can you know, have some kind of wacky out of the, uh, out of the box idea where you can put it into a series. And I I feel like that's what makes indie comics, you know, unbelievable. And, and I really feel like in a couple of years, you know, indie comics are going to, you know, I I feel like they're taking up more of the shelves now. And, and, and that's a good thing for, for, um, for the independent publishers. Well, writing an indie comic um, like Paranormal Hitmen brings certain challenges with it. Um, how have you gone about promoting the work, putting it out there for readers to find, and how do you overcome that indie challenge? Yeah, I mean, um, to to get the book out there, um, Wilson and I have been really hitting uh, Instagram and Facebook um, with the post and um, and on the different stories. I mean. We were trying to, you know, post in different um, collectors groups, uh, different indie comic groups, and um, like doing a, uh, um, a podcast, uh, for example, like we are now. I mean, th- th- those are probably the best things to, to get your indie comic book out there. Um, I mean, it's re- it is really tough because you don't have the – you know, the money like a uh, DC or Marvel or even image to, to, you know, buy ad space and promote that way. But, um, I will say behemoth does a good job as well, promoting on their social media sites and uh, Facebook pages. And, um, and I mean, unfortunately the thing that's tough this year is usually conventions is the best way to, to promote your book. But uh, unfortunately with, uh, the COVID situation, that kind of uh, dampened that um, that aspect for us, so it, it, it's been really tough. So the, I mean, that we we've been really going after it with social media to kind of take the place of the conventions. Yeah, there really is no good substitute for for the comic book convention circuit uh, in a t- in a time like this, which is really regrettable. Um, now. What do you see the, the, the future of Paranormal Hitmen being? Are you aiming for this to be a miniseries, a long-running, ongoing? What are sort of your, your, your long-term hopes for the property? So um, right now, um, the we have our first arc, which is going to be uh, four issues, and um, we have a trade coming out in the summer. Um, and then I actually have... 
another four, three or four issues kind of planned out um, to kind of push it further. Um, and as in terms of the property, I mean, there is, um, you know, interest out there for, you know, getting this optioned as a film or TV series. So I think that's going to help in the long run as well to kind of keep the paranormal hitman universe um, alive and running, you know, uh, with, uh, with more issues down the line. That's awesome. Um, so when can readers um, expect to see these in their local comic book shops? Has the first issue been released um, to the, to the public or, or is, are you currently working on the second issue? Um, when, when can fans expect to pick the book up? Yep. Uh, so the first issue releases February 10th and it should be up for pre-order. I believe next, next week it comes out, uh, the, the, the next, uh, previews, uh, catalog, which I think comes out either next Wednesday or, or around that time. Um, so, what um, what I, what I'm going to do on my end is, uh, you know, once it comes out in the previews catalog is it'll be posted on our, uh, social media, um, pages, uh, with the, uh, order code. And if anybody wants to order it, um, they would just have to go to their LCS um, and provide them with the uh, the order code, and, and they'll be able to order it for them. And as far as the series, I believe the plan is to have um, the issues come out each month. So February will be the first issue. The March on will be, uh, you know, issue two, three, and four, and then the trade will be in June or July. Um, so it's, it's going to come out in, um, in consecutive months, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the issues. Now, uh, a lot of indie comics begin life on crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter these days. I was very curious, uh, what your take was on that, uh, based on, um, on what you've said so far about the book, Paranormal Hitman wasn't a crowdfunded book. Uh, so what is your take on the whole uh, crowdfunding world? And is that something that you could see yourself doing? I know we interviewed um, we interviewed an author not too long ago who was big into the crowdfunding world. So what's your take on that? Yeah, um, so I actually did, ran a, um, a Kickstarter for a comic that I worked on. It was a, a horror anthology. Um with uh legacy comics and uh it's a great i mean i think kickstarter is a great way to to get your work out there and a great way to you know raise funds for artists and colorists and writers um but my experience with the kickstarter is i mean it, it was a lot of fun running it but it was very stressful um in terms of making sure everything was done on time, uh, you know, it's stressful, um, kind of not knowing whether or not you were going to reach your, your goals or even have it completely funded. And then when it comes time to shipping, it is just a nightmare, especially if it's a one person team, uh, running all that, um, you know, with the, the packaging and, and everything like that. It was, it was kind of rough. <laughs> so, I mean, it is, it is a great way to get, get everything out there. But I mean, I would suggest if somebody is going to run a Kickstarter, you know, make sure that you have kind of help when it comes time to printing and packaging everything and, and kind of coordinating all that, uh, all the, um, all the, uh, packaging, uh, work. It's, it, it's pretty rough. And now a lot of indie people aren't aren't the only ones, you know, doing Kickstarters and crowdfunding projects as well. A lot of established names in the comics industry are also, um, you know, maybe they work at the big two, but then like as a side project, they're also doing, um, you know, their own creator owned project. Um, what's your take on like somebody who already has kind of some influence in in the industry, you know, kind of taking up the same space as as people who are still trying to get their you know, big break. Yeah. I mean, my opinion 
like when I see uh, like Todd McFarlane, and I think Keanu Reeves just had one, and I think Scott Snyder recently had a Kickstarter. I mean, I feel like if you're already established, like a Todd McFarlane and a Keanu Reeves, I, I mean, I I don't like when when established writers and authors like that take the Kickstarter. Because I, I feel like it does take away from, you know, what Kickstarter is really meant for, which I feel like is more, you know, indie writers and artists that are, you know, trying to get to that next level, to get to the publisher that's on Diamond and can get to the comic shops. And I, I feel like they take away funds for those writers and artists book and and i i don't feel like kickstarter or indiegogo is a place for for todd mcfarland or scott snyder i i feel like it's it's just not helpful for for the indie community so uh at the end of each episode we like to hand out what we like to call nerd commendations for nerdy content we think more people should enjoy tv shows comic books you know what have you anything that fits sort of into the nerd world is there anything that you are reading or watching right now that you would recommend something that inspires you or that you find particularly interesting out there right now uh i mean obviously from uh i mean i'm sure everybody that's or most people that probably listen to uh, this podcast would probably uh, say, I mean, I, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so The Mandalorian is just, you know, it's just one of the best things that Star Wars has put out in a long time, and, and I, I love it. But, uh, I mean, I, I would say that's probably the, the most obvious uh, TV show that I, I could pick for... Uh, for somebody that might might be listening to the podcast, but um, another show that I've actually been watching, and I don't know if it's would be considered nerdy or not, but it's really well written, well directed, and the actors are great. Um, it's a TV show on Netflix called uh, The Queen's Gambit, and um, and I, I think that's just a just a well done uh. A TV show that I, I would suggest uh, people give a try. Yeah, if if, that, if memory serves, that's Anya Taylor Joy, who was in the New Mutants uh, as Ilyana. So it, it was interesting to see her, and, and I know that she's been connected to a lot of other projects. And I, I've heard a lot of buzz about the Queen's Gambit. And let's be honest, chess is still nerdy in my book. I know I still love playing chess. <laughs> yeah. So any any anytime I get some good chess media, is nerdy good news by me. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny because I I was uh, a little hesitant at first because I I've always wanted to play chess but I've I've never really learned how to play but the show is just so interesting and it's it's just well done it's it's even if you're not uh, into chess it's it's just a great show I I, I have the exact same experience but like man chess is super nerdy I should learn how to do that and then I just never took the time to sit down and learn <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll stick to checkers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any other projects that are currently in develop for you, Brett? Um, and, and what can you tease about the future for you? Yeah, so um, right now I'm working on a couple of um, licensed stuff with Behemoth. Um, uh, we can't really say what it is, um, especially the one project because it's um i think uh we're, we're still working on the storyline but it is going to be a, a licensed uh project for a video game um so that should be coming out i would say probably sometime in 2021 um i guess depending on pandemic and and uh um also uh you know, I guess seeing what's going on with the conventions. Um, but also I'm working on a couple other original uh, series um, that I'm hoping to have out in uh, 2021 as well. So, uh, yeah, um, I'm hoping to, you know, get those uh, pitches out there and, uh, and uh, see what we can do from there on. 
Oh, now that's really exciting. A licensed property, video game based, but we're not quite sure what it is yet. We're definitely going to have to keep our eye, eyes peeled for that. Um, so where can our listeners go to support your work, keep up with news about your writing? Yeah, um, so I, I don't have a Twitter, but um, I am on Instagram. And uh, you can find me at the Murphy Wright. And, um, and yeah, uh, uh, I'll, I, I usually uh, post updates on Paranormal Hitman and uh, other uh, works that I'll be uh, that I'll be doing on there. And uh, and also, um, and if people want to check out um, Wilson Gandafo, uh, he's on um, Instagram as well at W Gandafo and. Um, I would say check out his Instagram page. He has a lot of uh, cool art, whether it be for Paranormal Hitman or other projects that he's worked on. He's just a uh, an amazing artist. Well, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Brett Murphy. The book is Paranormal Hitman. He is the writer, co-creator, um, Behemoth Comics, coming at you in February 2021. So stick around. Brett, thanks so much for, for taking some time to talk with us today. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Ladies and gents, that wraps up our Byword Big Talk. Uh, thanks so much to Brett Murphy, uh, author, comic book writer, co-creator of Paranormal Hitmen. Uh, make sure to hit up your LCS uh, come February of next year when that book comes out. When we come back from this, our second and final break, we'll hit you with two more nerd commendations. <laughs> All right, we are back for our final segment, our patented nerd commendations. Dave, you took a page out of my book, pun intended, by recommending a new book. What you got? Yeah, you know, that's very odd for me. Uh, I, I tend to A, go with obscure, and B, go with older things when I'm recommending stuff. But here, not only am I recommending a newer book, I'm recommending something that's pretty much uh, well traveled already and well talked about it's it's kind of buzzing uh in the comic book world and that is crossover written by donny cates and with art by d knifey and uh jeff shaw so this is a brand new series from image comics and only the first issue has been released so far and i'm gonna be completely honest i'm nerd commending it i'm not even sure that i like this book yet I do feel, however, that it's worth nerd commending. There's a conversation happening in this book, a, a meta text about comics that I think is worth experiencing. Even if I love the book in the long run or I don't, th there is something here that I think is worth exploring. So Crossover is the story of the world of superheroes uh, colliding with the real world. One day, every superhero ever appears in the skies above Denver in a huge battle that kills countless people. Uh, one hero places a bubble around the state of Colorado where the fighting continues while the rest of the world is isolated away from it. Uh, so the world, because of this event, this crossover, um, experiences a fundamental shift. Nerds and comic book fans suddenly become sort of an oppressed minority under siege by hate groups. Enter Ellipsis Howell, a cosplayer and comic shop employee whose family is stuck under the bubble in Denver. And so a chance encounter with a comic book character provides her with hope that there's a chance she may see them again. Look, this, this sounds you know, fairly typical comic book plot, but this is heavy stuff. This is a book that begs to be talked about. It invokes, you know, Superman and, and the nature of hope that comic books um, actually inspire in people, the nature of comics and their impact on society and on, and on individuals. Uh, the book opens with a quote from uh, Wortham's Seduction of the Innocent, um, and there's so much going on here. There's lots of meta text here. It's ripe for exploration and discussion. So this sounds like the perfect book for me. And yet, and yet, there are some things off-putting about this book too. Uh, once again, we end up with a hate group that is essentially a stereotypical Christian hate group. You know, Westboro Baptist Church style. Uh, protesters standing outside of a comic book shop with picketing signs that read pray the capes away somehow 
that 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 trope and i've mentioned this before doesn't ring quite true although there are uh those kinds of groups out there it seems to be a little too easy uh for writers to rely on this trope as a shorthand for oppression and and somehow equating nerds uh as a group with real life oppressed minorities doesn't quite land for me uh, it seems odd especially in this day and age when nerds are in essence ruling the world dominating the box office uh, probably some of the most spending happy people driving whole economies really um it it seems odd um not saying it doesn't have the potential to work but i'm not sure it is working out of the gate. Now, the art here is uniformly strong and enjoyable. The, the question is what the writing ultimately will have to say, and I don't think that's 100% clear out of the first issue. Again, I'm not sure I like or dislike this issue. I'm not sure if I like or dislike this series as it'll continue. I do think, though, that this is a book worth reading. If nothing else, it should spark some really interesting conversations about comic books and 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 their message and what they're all about chris what do you think yeah i i i your last point exactly the last sentence that you said is is exactly you know the reason that this should be read so we can have these meta intuitive types of conversations about what it means and i'm i'm definitely intrigued um i i texted this to you because i just read this before we recorded um it was it was um, almost like uh, it, it was really like made me think and, and feel a lot of things that I don't know that I was ready to think and feel. Um, it, it was really, really something, man. Like, I don't even know what to say. Like, I, I, I cannot wait for issue two. I, I want to see where Donnie goes with this, especially from the writing. I really enjoyed the art, particularly the comic book characters. Um, the 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 comic character that showed up towards the end of the of the first issue was beautifully rendered with with the dots the Kirby dots um, if you will um, and I'm really just intrigued to where this goes I pr- I think probably the most um, effective scene for me the one that affected me the most was the comic book shop owner you know poo pooing these certain books um, one looked like it was the rawhide kid. Um, and the other one looked like it was something that was glorifying like police officers. So that was an interesting um, kind of social commentary, if you will. Um, so it, it's a lot to unpack in one issue. And uh, I'm definitely intrigued to see where it goes from here and, and how it unfolds. You know, and it's very interesting to me because as an image comic book, obviously, uh you know, these creators are not playing in the sandbox of the big two, but at the same time, they're playing in the sandbox of the big two. Uh, They're definitely speaking a, the language of superhero comics, but B, there are very, very clear uh, mentions, discussions uh, of recognizable characters. It's, you know, the, the book opens with a discussion of Superman and, and how real he is compared to, you know, quote unquote, real people. And there is definite implication there that these superheroes have a role to play in this story. And I'm quite curious how the creative team is going to get around the problem of simply not owning the rights to those characters. Um, and and I'm, I want to be clear, they're not talking about, you know, equivalent characters, you know, they're talking about the actual DC and Marvel characters. So as the book progresses, I'm very curious how they're going to work around that. Uh, they definitely got me curious in that element. Yeah, it explicitly says Superman on the very first page. And then if you're, um, you know, I'm, I'm a webhead, so I immediately saw Spider-Man in the background of the LCS in, in the book as well. Yeah, it's just it's just a fascinating concept. Um, I almost wished for a story like this that there would be cooperation between Image, Marvel, and DC just so they can actually go there, you know, fully all the way with these characters. Which, which has happened with images, you know, they've had, you know, Savage Dragon team up with, with, uh, you know, characters, if, if my memory serves. Yeah. It's hard telling where this is going to go right now. Uh, it's definitely one of the more interesting books on, on the stands right now. 
So, Chris, uh, let's get away from something that's too heavy, maybe, to something a little more lighthearted. What are you nerd commending this week? <laughs> it's definitely lighthearted. Um, I'm recommending uh, a new series on the uh, CBS All Access platform uh, called Star Trek Lower Decks. It is an adult animated series created by Mike McMahon. Uh, for CBS All Access. It is the ninth series in the Star Trek franchise and was launched uh, this year as part of executive producer Alex Kurtzman's expansion of the franchise. It is the first animated series created for All Access uh, All Access, and is the first Trek series since the 73-74 Star Trek the Animated Series. Um, it follows the support crew of the USS Cerritos in the year 2380. Um, basically, um, this is like the D list starship in Starfleet. Um, you know, like one, the, one of the first lines that they say, they don't handle first contact on this ship. They handle second contact. They go behind and fill out the paperwork and all the necessary signatures required with the new species. Um, and then on this ship of the lowest of the low of Starfleet, you have the lower decks who are just a bunch of ensigns and, and the, the, the four you know, primary protagonists. Um, so it's a kind of behind the scenes. It's, it's really kind of like a, a self parody of, of the Star Trek universe. Um, if I had one criticism of the show, it's a little bit too self-referential. Uh, you know, a lot of who am I, Captain Kirk, stuff like that is, is a little bit too much on the nose, but um the voice cast of this is is just really the strong suit of this. Um, it's really witty, it's really quippy, and it's really fun. Um, it, if I had to categorize it, it's like Star Trek through the eyes of like Family Guy. Um, you know, they bleep out any uh, uh, profanities, but they they still like let loose, like you know, with with language, they just bleep it out. But um, so yeah, like not not to the level of like Rick and Morty, like oh my god, graphic content type. But um, probably more along the lines of like a Family Guy type 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 show. But it's a really a lot of fun. Um, Tony Newsom as as the main character, Ensign Beckett Mariner, is just a revelation. She is hilarious. She is um, the 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 uniform, the top button of the uniform unbuttoned, her sleeves rolled up. She's you know the loose cannon, the Han Solo type of the crew. She's she's awesome. Jack Quaid plays um, Ensign Brad. Boimler, he's the the goody two shoes, the brown nose are really really nervous, and they're like best friends, so that's interesting. Then you've got uh, Noelle Wells plays Ensign Devon Attendi. She's like this just like extreme optimist. She's an Orion uh, of the species Orion. She's like everything is amazing. Everything is cupcake and rainbows. And I can't believe I'm here to clean the conference room. Um, there's an episode where she gets mistakenly pulled on like this covert operation as the cleaner because she was cleaning the conference room. And it's just like all of these. Oh God. Um, Eugene Cordero plays uh, Ensign Samantha Rutherford. He's kind of like the Jordy of the crew, if you will. Um, you know, he, he's got a cyborg implant and he just loves engineering. There's nothing more like the, he, he likes to sit like he'll, he'll be like, Hey, you want to go watch the warp core with me? Like, he's just fascinated by, he loves his job so much. So, um, Don Lewis is captain Carol Freeman. She's a delight. Jerry O'Connell is commander Jack Ransom, who is basically Will Riker. It like a, it's a parody on Will Riker. He's an oversexed, like, macho man uh, so that's hilarious uh fred tatashori who a lot of nerds will know as like the hulk voice actor in a lot of animated properties he's lieutenant Shax, and he is this big buff bajoran security chief so that's fun and jillian vigman is great she's dr taata she's like this cat like the chief medical officer but she's like this cat species um paul Shear. um is Lieutenant Commander Andy Billups. He has a great mustache. I, I just love everything about this show. Like I said, it's a little bit too self-referential. It's a little bit too on the nose, but it's just a lot of fun to unwind and throw on a 20-minute episode that makes you laugh about nerdy stuff that we love. Yeah, so I've not watched this, but I'm definitely interested. I'm usually really hesitant about a franchise trying to make fun of itself. Usually, to me at least, parody uh, is more effective when it comes from the outside looking in. Uh, but from what I've heard, Lower Decks has enough heart and really the spirit of Trek in addition to the humor 
that, that I can see it working and I'm definitely curious about it. You know, not to go off on a detour, pun intended, but, but this kind of reminds me a little bit of that show that was produced and never appeared, Star Wars Detours. Have you heard of that, Chris? Yeah, so this is fascinating. So the people that did Robot Chicken, in essence, uh, were producing a uh, CGI animated comedy series. They produced like two seasons, 39 episodes. And then before it was released to the public, Disney bought Lucasfilm and took all 39 episodes and shelved them indefinitely. So except for a few short clips and trailers, this show has never been seen. But there is an equivalent of a, you know, a show, a franchise making fun of itself uh, in Lucasfilm literally sanctioning Star Wars detours, and yet we've never really seen it. And I would be so fascinated to see some of those episodes just to compare how Star Trek makes fun of itself and how Star Wars makes fun of its- itself. I-, I would be really interested in how the- their approach to self-parody compares. Um so I'm really interested in watching Lower Decks, but I also would really like to be able to make that comparison. Oh, yeah. You had me at Robot Chicken. So the Robot Chicken Star Wars is some of my favorite Star Wars content, um, you know, of all. So And, and God bless Seth Green uh, for, for, for making that. So every, everything that he does is just hilarious to me. Oh, I absolutely agree. All right, nerds, that wraps up another episode of the Nerd Byword podcast. Thanks so much for being along the ride uh, for with us and, and thanks again to Brett Murphy and be sure to check out paranormal hit then when it hits local comic shops uh, come February. Um, as always, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at nerd by word, Facebook at the nerd by word. And you can find us individually on Instagram and Twitter at that nerd Dave and at that nerd Chris respectively. And thank you so much for your support. We appreciate you tuning in week after week. Uh, Next week, of course, is a big one for us. We're going to be hitting uh, six months of Nerd by Word. Uh, In the middle of a pandemic, we were able to uh, get together and and create this podcast, which uh, has been an absolute joy. And we certainly hope we're bringing a little bit of joy into your lives during this whole crazy time as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, guys. And and be sure to keep your eyes peeled on our Instagram page. We're going to we have hit 1500 followers. We thank you so much for your support. And we're going to be uh, launching a brand new giveaway to celebrate uh, 1500 followers. So uh, stay well. And, and, and as always, stay nerdy. The Nerd Byword is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez and show art by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available.